Hope everybody's doing well. Welcome to episode number 11 of In and Around Pleasant Hill podcast with Alex Coded at. In this episode, I will be interviewing the mayor of Pleasant Hill, Sue Nowak. And as always, do me a big favor. Please make sure you subscribe to our podcast and make sure you share with someone that you think that might be able to benefit from it. Um, Sue, welcome. Thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're welcome. My pleasure. So uh, uh, as, as I said at the beginning, you know, um, you being the mayor of Pleasant Hill, I know there's been a lot of challenges, um, especially, you know, last year and this year, but let's just do a deep dive into, you know, your, your, your life as a mayor, but let's just go a little bit more, more into it and tell us about, you know, what inspired you to even get into politics, please. Sure. So uh, I'll go way back. And I was born and raised in Connecticut. And my dad was a lawyer. My mom had immigrated from the Netherlands. Um, so but the two of them together, along with my three sisters, we did a lot of community service activities. I swore my parents ran most of the nonprofits in town beside, you know, their their normal work days. Um, and so we all grew up sort of with a community type spirit. And my dad then, uh, as a lawyer, ran for election to be a judge later on. Um, at that time, I helped him um, uh, campaign, and I swore I would never do that again, but obviously that, that didn't come out, work out. So I spent, um, I have an undergrad and grad degree in business, and um, I went into banking and finance for about 26 years and uh, did that, and in 1995, moved out to California. I met my husband out here, uh, had a son, and he's 19 right now, but um I was still in the corporate world at that time when I had my son and my husband, and I decided a couple of years later, five years when he went to school that I would try to kick back from my, my corporate life and take care of my son. So I did that. And I was fortunate. I was able to do that. However, I also realized I am a lousy housewife and housekeeper. So um, I had to go find something else to do. So while my son was in, in school, I looked around for other ways I could give back to the community. I started out by running the PTA at Strandwood and then later on for Pleasant Hill Middle School. Uh, I, in 2008, I started the Foundation for Pleasant Hill Education, ran that for about 10 years and um, raised over $300,000 for our schools. It's a great experience. Um, and then I joined Rotary. So I joined Rotary and just looking for that thing to challenge me, keep me interested and engaged, but also giving back to the community at the same time. So with my finance background, I don't remember when exactly it was. A couple of people approached me, you should run for city council, you should run for city council. Um, I think initially they tried to get me run for a school board, but um, I decided I didn't have enough. I could contribute and really do a lot there. So when a couple of people approached me about running for city council, I thought about it and there was some discord going on at the time. And I thought, you know what, this might be a good time to do it. My son was going into eighth grade. He was pretty self-sufficient, but I thought it would be good for him to become even more self, self-sufficient, self you know, taking making uh, time management, things like that. So I thought, well, we'll see how this goes. So I ran for uh, city council 2014. Yeah, it was a squeaker of a race. Uh, the top two vote getters got in. Uh, the first place vote, vote getter was 99 points votes ahead of me. And the third place was 113 behind me. So it was it was a close race, but I ended up winning a seat um, that year and I uh, got on to uh, started January of 2015 in politics. So um, it's been a fascinating, fascinating process. Um, and while there are lots of ups and downs, you know, I really feel like um, I've I've done some things to contribute to the community. So it's been real positive. about some of the contribution that you have done since mm -hmm. you've become a city councilman? Sure. I think, you know, there are, there are a handful of things. I think the biggest one, the, probably the most noticeable for people, is in 2016, we approved Measure K, and that was to improve the infrastructure um, of, the, of the community, road work, you know, storm drains, things like that, along with building a new library. And uh, that was a successful campaign, and, and as you may see when you drive by on Oak Park, uh, the library is 50% done, and that's just going to be a really exciting thing. So 
Um, I was the lead campaign person on Measure K, and I was mayor that year as well. Um, so I really feel that was, um, you know, I, I contributed a lot. I was, it certainly wasn't mine alone. There were lots of people involved. Lots of people really contributed to that effort. Um, but I feel like I, I had a good hand in that. So that's one of my, my things. Um, I think we spent a lot of time in 2017 really focused on inclusion and diversity, as, as, as you're well aware. 2017, when the immigration issues were coming up, uh, we really wanted to make sure that Pleasant Hill was, um, we had a resolution to make sure we were a welcoming city, but not only just doing that resolution, but then taking it further along. As you know, this year, we, um, I, I requested council to approve forming a diversity committee. We've had subcommittees, but this will be a bigger um, committee that will reach all aspects of the city and not just segmented pieces. Um, so I think that's really uh, an important thing um, to do for the city as well. And I think I think that's been fairly evident. Right. Um, and, and, and tell us about the diversity committee. I know it's a new committee and, and, it is. and, and, and to go a little bit more into it. T tell us about that. What is that? What does that look like? Well, what it really is, what it came from is initially when we approved this um, uh, inclusionary and welcoming city, we wanted, how did we turn that into actions besides just having a resolution? So we first went to our Civic Action Commission and said, please include, um, think about how you can add diversity and inclusion into your events and things like that. So people feel included in all our civic um, activities. And so they formed a subcommittee. And as you may know, they did the uh, community conversations and, and things like that. So they've been really doing a good job of that the last couple of years. Um, and then we had a subcommittee forum in the Ed Commission, in which I was involved with as well, looking at making sure anti-racist um, uh, and there was no bias in the schools anymore. So what they can do, and they've been providing a lot of tools for teachers and the schools to use to educate people on what's going on and what they can think about as far as that goes. And then uh, our Commission on Aging also took a look at this and said, you know, can we form a subcommittee? Well, with all these subcommittees, I realized that there's so many aspects that diversity um, can benefit as a community. I thought, you know what, we just need a bigger group to take a look at everything. Our practices internally at City Hall, um, how we do business, how we interact, all aspects. So at some point, I'm hoping that these subcommittees have made their own committees so aware of diversity that it will become just you know, second nature. Everything they do, they will be thinking about diversity, and then they may not need subcommittees. But then we've got this broad diversity committee that will make sure everything we do keeps that in mind. Um, so that's really, that was really the purpose of forming this broader diversity committee. Now, past those broad guidelines, it's really going to be up to this committee as to how they operate and sort of their more uh, goals uh, and tactics and, and what they're going to do. And so their first meeting, I believe, is this going to be this month. So it's just been voted on, just been formed, um, interviewed. Uh, my understanding and from the you know, take a look at the people that are going to be on the committee. I think this is going to be fascinating to see um, what they come up with and how they operate. So it'll be exciting to see. That's wonderful. Great. Now, also, um, you've talked about your accomplishment. Well, what, what challenges have you had? I mean, in, in the since 2050, what challenges? Yeah, we've had a lot of challenges. Um, oh, sorry, you're, you're in and out a little bit there. Um, we've had some challenges here in the city, obviously. Um, some of the challenges are addressing the infrastructure. You know, you have roads and things like that. Historically, we had 24 zones in the city and we repaved one, sort of one zone every, tw every year. That meant 24 years before we get repaving done. That was getting to a point where that was too long. So we had to shorten that up. So that's part of the measure K dollars is figuring that out. So there's some, and there's some storm drain issues that need to be addressed. Some things like that are infrastructure wise. Um, but we've also got some big challenges with respect to housing issues. Uh, nobody knows it, but there's nobody, it's, it's a fine line. We have a lot of pressure from Sacramento to get more housing here, as you well know. Um, yet, 
our town wants to keep that small town feel. It is a very difficult uh, balancing act because I think a lot of people recognize and acknowledge that we need more housing, but they don't necessarily want it in their backyard. And I don't want to call it NIMBYism because I can certainly appreciate everybody's desire for that. So trying to do that in a thoughtful way and make sure people understand the issues and challenges we're face facing and doing what we need to do uh, for the state, you know, state requirements is a, is a, is a big challenge for us. So uh, we will keep addressing that, but that's, um, that's tricky. We do have, uh, you know, go ahead. So mayor, uh, question. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting because most, uh, I mean, look around here, usually when someone becomes I'm sorry, Alex, I'm, I'm missing. The, the, the taking turns at first. Sorry, say it again. Say, say repeat that question, sorry. Uh, about, be, about being a mayor, you're elected as a mayor for one year and then, then the next year you become a city councilman. And can you tell us, let, let us know about that? Like how does that how look that like? works? Is it a four year term or yes? We each have four year terms, but we're offset. So next year, two of us will be up for election. Then two years later, there's three. So that there's never five new council members at any one point in time. It's staggered like that. Okay. We do take turns being mayor, everybody's mayor for, you know, everybody takes turns being mayor, vice mayor, and then mayor. And it normally goes in a cycle. Sometimes there's little hiccups. For example, the first time I was mayor was my second year on council, but the person that was supposed to be, David Durant was supposed to be mayor, had taken on a big job where he was gonna be traveling a lot and was unable to do it. So he was nominated, he was second, and then he turned it down nominated me second and all of a sudden I was mayor without being vice mayor. So that was a little, that was a little out of sync. Um, but really we operate as five council members, five equal council members. The difference you have as a mayor is you get to put the agenda together. So if there's something you want on the agenda, like the diversity committee, that I could put on the agenda as mayor. I don't have any different vote, but I have that ability to put something on the agenda. And the other thing is when you're mayor, you are the face of the city that year. Um, you know, so whether it's whether it's just at local community events. Um, the other day I got to, I was fortunate enough to be on a press conference with the US Secretary of Energy. That was, you know, that was an incredible experience. Um, but that's you have to be sort of ready to do all those things in your year as mayor. But you we really act as a five council function on all decisions regardless of who's mayor or vice mayor. Now, what about the challenges with COVID right now? Last year, Mad Ren had a lot of challenges. Yeah, we have, a, you know, there are, we, Pleasant Hill financially was very fortunate with our COVID. Um, financially, as a city, we were, we were in pretty good shape because 40% of our revenues were driven off of uh, sales tax dollars. We were very concerned with COVID that that would really impact our ability to have sufficient funds to pay for police and all the services we needed to provide. We were fortunate in that the county shares sales tax driven from online businesses. So what we lost in some of our sales tax was made up for by the county. So while we expected to actually drop our reserves during COVID, that didn't happen. Um, so from a financial perspective, Pleasant Hill is still very fortunate to be in good shape. I think this, the, the challenge we have now is there are a lot of companies, despite the city being in good shape, that were impacted severely, negatively. Um, you know, we could do some things during COVID, like the outdoor eating, some areas like that, uh, providing uh, PPE, you know, stickers, labels for, you know, social distancing, things like that. But now we have to focus as we're hopefully coming out of this on how we can help our city recover. Uh, how those businesses, because there are some businesses that have gone away through this or have really struggled. So what we can do to help bring that, bring them back, um, bring new businesses in where we've lost some, 
and what we can do as an economy to get our city going again. So um, we will be taking a close look at that um, over the next uh, several months, how we can do, we're getting, we're hiring a new economic development director, our last one retired, and uh, we have an economic development committee. So we will be spending quite a bit of time trying to see what we can do to uh, help our businesses. Are there gonna be any, do you see, uh, in your planning, are there gonna be any grants or anything for the local businesses like you guys had before where yeah. they got $1,500 for outdoor or $1,000 for advertising? Will you have anything like that again? We, we expect that we will be doing that. Um, we are looking at the economic development because we did get some money from the federal government. And so we are, you know, we're, I'm sit on the budget committee, so it will come through budget committee as to how much is going to be um, allocated to economic development um, and then what we can do to help. So there'll probably be some type of grant program uh, put together. We're, you know, sort of hoping to get that new economic development person on board quickly so we can get this going. Um, but we expect we'll have, you know, some announcements and discussions about that in the next several months. Now, Sue, you know, um, not just in, in, in Pleasant Hill, but all of California, we've had a, you know, huge, uh, you know, um, concern about the homelessness. Yeah. You know, there's homelessness everywhere. Yeah. Um, is City of Pleasant Hill, are they being proactive? Is there anything that they're, you guys are, you know, trying to implement to help with these folks? Yeah. So several years ago, um, we put um, a core team in place. And I don't know if people are aware of core. And I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mess up the uh, acronym somewhere. It's community outreach. Uh, but it's basically uh, people that come into Pleasant Hill, establish a relationship with the homeless, because many of them are distrustful of police or other types of people trying to interact with them and do things. So the core team comes in and they really try to establish a good relationship um, with and build some trust with the homeless so that they can help them get the services they need, whether it be mental help, whether it be home, um, you know, whether they're vets and, and they're not getting their vet, vet benefits, things like that. So that's what that core group does. The county started that program a while ago, but we realized that we were not going to get much attention versus some of the bigger cities that needed more of that help. So Martinez and Pleasant Hill joined together and are paying for our own team. So, um, that's awesome. so that's been, that's been really helpful. I did a ride along with those guys one morning. Fascinating how how uh, how well they knew these people, and 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 they've actually really had a great deal of success. Probably more so prior to COVID, um, getting people the services they needed, getting them off the street into shelters and things like that. They know who to work with. They know the in and out. So. That's a big piece. I think the second piece is trying to really work with the county. The county mental health, they're, they're, they're doing a lot of work in that area. They've received money from the federal government. Um, they did the Measure X. Those two things are going to help them be able to put mental health services into place that I think will provide all the cities. So we will continue to work closely with the county to, to make sure that those services that the county are putting together will work well for Pleasant Hill as well. And so awesome. those are the two of the things. Um, um, so, so, uh, if some local want to know you can direct them to? So if, if people that have concerns about the homeless, the, the number to call is 211. That, that, that number is the number that people can call to let them know that there may be a homeless person in crisis, things like that. And they, the 211 people know all the people to go to, the right services to send. Um, you know, if they can't get a hold of that, obviously, then the police are the next uh, place to call. But 211 is the really the good starting point because they are the ones that know where the shelters are, know where the availability is, where the services are that they can help these people. So that's what they should do if they have some concern. Um, about now what about what about for businesses? If businesses want to know about the 
the new economic development plans that are coming out, what about them? Is that, do they go to the city website? Where can they go to find out what's going on with that? I assume it will be on the city website. I think this is going to come into play when this new economic development person comes on board, which should be shortly. And once that person is on board, they will be putting it on the, on the city website. I'm sure they'll be working with the Chamber of Commerce um, in you know a variety of methods to get that information out to, to people. So it just won't be the city website. I'm sure it'll be in the Outlook, um, you know, the, the uh, bi-monthly uh, newsletter that comes out, that information will be in there. So um, I'm hoping we try to reach out in many different aspects and of course, social media as well. So um, hopefully we'll, uh, the new economic de development person will hit the ground running and get that going right away. Absolutely, and especially with the, with the, with the, with the Facebook group that I've created, we'd be able to you know get the word out. With Absolutely, the, to be able to help businesses. So a day, you know, uh, uh, the 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 title of the uh, our our podcast was a life of a mayor. You know, on a daily basis. Like, what do you do? Like, what does your day yeah. look like on a starting <laughs> Monday? How does that? You know, yeah, you know. I, I, I wish there was sort of a, a, a normal day for the life of the mayor, but it, it's not. I, you know, just to give people an idea, though. So with the city, we all have committees that we sit on. It's just not our two you know, council meetings that people think we have these two meetings and then we're done for the day. So I sit on the budget committee, uh, which you know, has to meet fairly regularly. We do a long term forecast and we also do a two year budget process. Um, but I also sit on the um, library subcommittee, which I can't tell you how many hours I've spent over the last several years. Uh, Michael Harris and I are working on getting this new library up and going. Uh, it's going to be fantastic, though. I sit on the education task force and I sit on the general plan advisory committee. That's the general plan that we're planning out for now out through 2040. But in addition to those things, I represent the city on the county connection of the bus service, um, the central Contra Costa Bus Service County Connection Board, and I have since I've I, I've joined the council. Um, I also represent the city on Transpac, which is the Regional Transportation Planning Group, and then I represent Transpac on CCTA, which is the Contra Costa uh, Trans uh, Transportation Authority, which does all the road work and the highway work and things like that. So I I sit on that committee as well. And, the, and then I, we have subcommittees as well. I sit on finance subcommittees quite, in quite a few places because of my background. So, you know, this week I have two finance subcommittee meetings. I have a planning subcommittee meeting. I actually sit on a budget advisory committee for the school district as well, not as a city council member. I just happen to do that. Uh, and I have, um, so in many of those meetings are at night. But there's a lot of reading that you have to do beforehand because you get in these meetings and you're expected to discuss the issues, the topics you have to vote on. You have to know them and understand them. So a good portion of my day might be looking at that stuff. Um, but, you know, then you're called on, uh, you know, to do, you know, other things like, uh, you know, as I mentioned before, going to this um, speaking on our solar app that we have. Um, at City Hall and going to this press conference and all of a sudden having to uh, speak. I thought I was just there for a photo op, but I ended up having to speak. Um, so going and doing those things uh, is also a part of your day. And then when you're out in public, non-COVID times, when you're out in public, you are talking to lots of people. I mean, my husband will not go with me to the grocery store because I won't get out of there for you know half an hour longer, uh, which is great. I mean, I love doing that. He does not. I, I do. Uh, and also going to restaurants where we were going to run into people. He and my son usually take a separate car so that they don't have to wait for me to to be done chatting with people. So, uh, you know, that's, you know, it's part it's part of the job I love. Uh, you know, we do a lot of fun things with kids coming into City Hall, mock city council meetings. I'll tell you one of my best experiences. I was at a concert in the park one night and this girl walked over with her father and she wanted to introduce him to me. And uh, she said, do you remember me? And I said, were you at Mock City Council? And she said, yes, I was. And the father turned to me and he said, you know, I've been trying to convince her to do student government and couldn't get her to do it until she met you. And now she's on student council. To me, that, you know, makes it all worthwhile to the extent I could inspire somebody to do that. That was just a fantastic experience. So I love um, it. 
yeah, so that's kind of, you know, a day of a mayor, there's no, there's no set day, honestly. It is, it can go every which way and it can start early in the morning or it could just go into late at night. You just have to be fairly flexible with your schedule. Well, Mayor, I really want to appreciate your time. Thank you for taking the time to talk. Is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we go? No, I just encourage, what I really want to do is encourage people to really take the time to get involved, go look. There's so much misinformation out there on social media and it's so hard. I try, I, you know, most of us don't want to get into social media and start answering questions because things get blown out of proportion and we really can't explain it well enough on social media without dealing with a lot of misinformation. So, you know, I encourage people, send us emails, ask us the questions directly, pick up the phone and call us. We're all fairly reachable. Take our Citizens Academy where you can learn how the city actually runs. Come to our general plan advisory committee meetings. They're all public so that you don't, you know, you feel like you have a voice in what's going on. We can only represent what we hear from people. And if you okay. don't get involved, it's really hard then later on for people to say, well, I didn't know. I, we can't, you know, we can't go out and knock on everybody's door on every, but every issue. So I just want to encourage people to get involved with the, you know, with the community. And, you know, you're a perfect example. You took on, you know, getting involved in the community, doing your in around Pleasant Hill, which has been incredible. And we've had a bunch of, you know, Jason Olson with his thing on Grocery Outlet, what's going on in the store. And it's amazing the people that have come out and have really done great things for our community during this COVID. And, you know, I can't say how much we appreciate what you've done and others have done to make that happen. And, um, you know, we, we wish everybody could do something similar to make our community as, as strong as it is. Well, we appreciate you and everything you've done for our community. Thank you, Mayor. You're, you're welcome. So guys, do me a favor and watch our future episodes. Uh, make sure you uh, listen in and subscribe and share uh, this episode and our past episodes with folks that you think that might benefit from it. Thank you guys for tuning in. And thank you again, Sue. I hope you have a wonderful day. Yeah, thanks, Alex. Bye. Bye.